Video Lecture 3.2, Pressure Gradient and Coriolis Force. Our second driving force is the Pressure Gradient Force. The simple idea here is that we've already talked about this semester, this stuff once again builds and builds and builds, the fact that Earth's surface across our surface, it's heated differently. Uh, so it varies from place to place. Uh, and so this, because of this, there's areas of high pressure and areas of low pressure. Cold, dense air is what we would think of as higher pressure. Uh, because it's heavier. Um, so a high pressure, we think of it being cooler, uh, representing cooler places. Uh, and it's going to exert a greater pressure uh, than warmer, less dense areas that are typically found, once again, along the equator. We all know the reasons why. Uh, consistent day lengths of the, on along the equator, high sun angle causes those warm temperatures. Uh, and so a very important point. Uh, air flows from high to low. Uh, so constantly have this high to low pattern until the pressures equalize. A great example to showcase this is a basketball. I pump a basketball full of air, really as, you know, as, as much as I can pump it. Then I pop a hole in it. The sound I would get would be what? And then eventually it fades away. That sound is essentially the high pressure inside the ball wanting to escape until it's equalized with the pressure outside the ball. Uh, and once that happens, you stop hearing that sound. Uh, and so that's an example of a high to low pressure. You can feel that air coming out of the basketball um, in that example. Uh, so on a weather map, one of the things you're going to see is you're going to see isobar lines. Once again, isobar lines map or illustrate uh, uh, atmospheric pressure. Uh, and these are going to be showcased on the map, and when they're close together, that means it's a very steep pressure gradient, i.e. that means it's very, uh, from one place it's only maybe would say 100 miles from another place, if the lines are very close to each other, it means you're going to have a big difference between pressure from one place to another, uh, just over that 100 miles. And so because of that, you should expect fast wind speeds. And so close isobar lines illustrate high wind a high pressure is much different than a low pressure. A high pressure is sinking or subsiding air. And that makes sense because it's heavy, dense air that sinks because it's so heavy. When it reaches the surface, it diverges and goes outward in all directions. That differs considerably from a low pressure, which involves rising air that pulls and converges air from all directions. And so it pulls air in and then when it pulls it in, it forces it to then rise. Now we're going to look at high pressures and low pressures from a couple different perspectives. And so first off the top view. So this is as if we're looking down at a high pressure and low pressure below us. A high pressure is going to go outward in all different directions, or a low pressure going inward. Uh, now let's take a look kind of at the side view. So now we're looking at the side view of these low pressures and high pressures rather than looking from above. And so from the side view, a high pressure we're going to see descending, diverging, but going outward in all different directions. And so I'm doing yoga here. Um, so in my yoga example, when I'm doing this, I'm simulating a high pressure. Uh, descending, diverging in all different directions. Now when I'm doing this, uh, now I'm illustrating a low pressure. Low pressures ascend, converge, and rise. Uh, so two different characteristics, the top view and the uh, cross-section view of a high pressure and a low pressure. Now we have our Earth here, so the schematic of Earth. We can kind of take these two ideas uh, that we've learned beforehand, the whole idea of warm air rising, cold air coming and taking its spot, but also high pressure to low pressure, uh, and apply that to a general circulation flow uh, here on Earth. And so along the equator, warmer temperatures, we already know why that's the case, uh, so we should expect a low pressure to develop over here because warmer places we associate with uh, low pressures, whereas colder places we associate with high pressures, colder, denser, heavier air. Uh, and so generally, and this isn't completely accurate, I'm not going to come back later in the video uh, and explain this, but we should expect a general flow uh, as far as uh, high pressure to low pressure. And so on Earth, because we have this warmer uh, low pressure that exists over the equator, we should expect to have this kind of this cold, dense air coming towards the equator and then heading back towards the poles uh, would be uh, in you know, colder air. And it gets colder because it gets to a higher altitude, higher elevation, which we've learned about beforehand. And we should expect this general circulation flow. Uh, like I said, not completely accurate. Now let's apply this to actual real 
uh, life um, a city and coastline uh, perspective. And so here's city A and city B. City B, 60 degrees Fahrenheit during the day, whereas city A, it's only 40 degrees because of cloud cover. We already know the reasons for that uh, in a previous uh, discussion. Which city is more likely to develop a low pressure? It's going to be city B. Why? Because city B is warmer. Uh, so city B is warmer, and so we should expect this low pressure to develop. And so subsequently, what we're going to get is we're going to get a high pressure and a low pressure to form. We're going to get that high to low pressure um, situation. So we should expect a wind pattern to go from city A uh, to city B. Let's also take this now to coastlines. And so a water body and the land mass. We already learned that land masses heat up much faster but also cool down much faster than water bodies. And so taking those ideas, we should expect during the day a low pressure to develop over a land mass. Develop over land mass because it's heating up all day long. It's going to go, once again, it's going to heat up much faster than a water body. A low pressure develops and so then we should expect to get a high to low pressure. And so it's very common during the day to have a breeze coming from the water onto the shoreline, onto uh, the landmass, onto your, your uh, nice happy little beach here. Uh, however, at night, uh, when you're over here at night on the beach doing uh, Lord knows what, you get a different pattern going on. Uh, because once again, uh, water is kind of sluggish to heat up, but also sluggish to cool down. And so we should expect actually a low pressure to develop over a water body. And now we get an opposite breeze. A breeze coming from the land and now going over the beach across and onto uh, over the water body. So we have an opposite uh, pattern here uh, overnight. Uh, and so a uh, last way to showcase all of this, uh, high to low, uh, we already know that and so we should expect these arrows to go this direction. Uh, but another thing is these green lines illustrate isobars. When we go back from, uh, from an earlier uh, discussion, isobars measure air pressure. Uh, so if you notice these isobar lines, the pressure goes down as we get closer to that L. Makes sense. Lower pressure, higher pressure. But another characteristic is when these lines are close together, like we see here, we should expect faster winds. Uh, whereas over here, because those isobar lines are spread out more of an area, we should expect a lot, much uh, lighter winds uh, than we would find uh, over here uh, closer to this low pressure. So in this example here, where are the winds the strongest? And if we don't know much about what we're looking at, just essentially think where do we see the greatest difference between colors. And that greatest difference between colors is right in this area right through here. And so here, the high pressure center, there the low pressure center, we know high to low. We know the general direction of the wind in this area is going to be going in that direction, but it's also going to be quite fast because of those isobar lines being very close together. Further differences between a high pressure and a low pressure are that a high pressure in the northern hemisphere, it spirals clockwise. And so you can just by looking at the wind direction, be able to identify if something is a high pressure or low pressure by the direction that they are spiraling. And so the northern hemisphere, high pressures spiral clockwise. We also refer to high pressures as anticyclones or anticyclones. Key to understanding a high pressure is when one is in the area. When we are dominated by a high pressure, we should think of clear skies. No clouds or few clouds, or if there are, they're just those cumulus clouds randomly in the sky. Very calm conditions, and what we would think of as just very peaceful, fair conditions. Doesn't necessarily mean it's hot, uh, but just means that the weather is clear and it's not too stormy. That differs considerably from a low pressure where a spiraling counterclockwise flow uh, in wind direction is what we would expect to find in the northern hemisphere, of course, the opposite in the, in, in the southern hemisphere. These are called cyclones. Now, don't think of these as cyclones as far as tornadoes and twisters, uh, but we refer to a low pressure as a cyclonic activity. Uh, we'll talk more about that. So when a low pressure is in the area, oftentimes you often also see stormy weather, rain, precipitation, snow, and winding changing conditions. And so a low pressure, much different characteristics than a high pressure, which is also illustrated here in these diagrams. And I'll let you pause it, stop, look, analyze. Our third key driving force within Earth's atmosphere is the Coriolis force. Key to understanding this is it causes a deflection of all moving objects, missiles, airplanes, hurricanes, from its straight path due to Earth's rotation. So Earth's rotation is key to understanding and causing the Coriolis force. If Earth didn't rotate, all winds would go in a 
perfectly straight line from a high to low pressure. Uh, one thing to kind of understand is we once again have our differences between hemispheres. And so in the northern hemisphere, the Coriolis force is going to cause everything to deflect to the right. doesn't matter if it's going north, south, east, or west. In the northern hemisphere, it's going to deflect to the right. In the southern hemisphere, it's the opposite, deflects to the left. Now, this is one of the things that has often been used in pop culture. There's a Simpsons episode in which the toilet goes the opposite direction that it does here in the United States, arguing because it's the Coriolis force which causes the toilet to go the other direction. Uh-uh. That's only because of the direction the water comes spouting out of uh, in the toilet causes the direction that it spins. Uh, so this has nothing to do with the Australian toilets going a different direction than the United States ones. Now I'm going to talk about why the Coriolis force causes everything in the northern hemisphere to deflect to the right. Uh, so here we have a plane in the North Pole, and that plane's heading straight down a particular longitude line, heading, heading, uh, going straight through China. Uh, let's say it's ending up in there in the Himalayas. Uh, so it's going from the North Pole straight south to the Himalayan mountains. Uh, because the Earth is rotating underneath that plane, so that plane's flying to that destination, it's rotating, that the plane will actually end up way further west of its intended target. And so it'll actually end up over here in the Middle East instead of ending up in the Himalayas because of that Earth's rotation happening underneath that plane flight. Um, so one way to showcase a uh, whole Coriolis force. Now that Coriolis force is going to be more exaggerated uh, the closer you get to the poles. Uh, along the equator, it's not really too much of an exaggeration, in fact, none at all. Uh, whereas we get closer to the poles, and it's even more exaggerated, that whole Coriolis force. Uh, and so once again, this is a way to showcase the whole idea of everything in the northern hemisphere deflecting to the right, and everything in the southern hemisphere would be then uh, subsequently to uh, the left. And so finally, taking in sum, uh, the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force, which force explains the direction of the yellow arrow? Pressure gradient force, high to low. Which, uh, which helps explain the uh, direction of the purple area? Coriolis force. Uh, so then the net result of the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force is a very much a general bend to the right of these arrows. Get that stuck in the head for why we're going to see a ton of arrows in the northern hemisphere bending to the right and then ones in the southern hemisphere bending to the left. It's the combination of the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force working together so that the average of the two creates this curve to the right.